Hey everyone, welcome back to Practically Intelligent. This is Akshay. I'm a venture capitalist based in Seattle. And as always, I'm Sanan Osdemer, an AI entrepreneur, author, and educator based uh, here in currently sunny San Francisco. Awesome. Well, Sanan, uh, today we're interviewing Sudhir Hasbe, the Chief Product Officer at Neo4j, a graph database and analytics company. Prior to Neo4j, uh, Sudhir was the product leader behind Google's analytics product lines. He managed several hundred million dollars in uh, product revenue related to data and ML at Google. And we're talking to Sudhir about graph databases and the intersection of RAG, aka graph RAG. This is a very en vogue topic. Uh, so I'm curious to get your thoughts and Sudhir's thoughts, Nan. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you said en vogue topic because it's not really an en vogue almost technology in the sense that we've had pretty much all of the components of GraphRag in some capacity for the last 20 years, right? The idea that graph, you know, knowledge graphs are this new thing, they're not. Google started using them over a decade ago. The the idea that we have these generative AIs, even they're not as new as most people think. So what one thing that we really get into, and I think is really interesting, is is not just the history of all these components, but why now is it so that everyone is really trying to get their hands on some kind of graph frag implementation. Like, what is it about this year, 2024, that everyone decided this is the right technology to chase after? And I think Sudhir has some really cool insights as to why this is the right moment for this kind of technology. So, I mean, frankly, without further ado, I, th I say we jump right in. Let's do it. Awesome. Sudhir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. Well, great. I think just to start, it'd be interesting if you could provide a little background on what Neo4j is, and we can dive use that to dive into how that's uh, becoming pretty interesting and relevant uh, for language model applications. But maybe just starting with uh, Neo4j and what Neo4j does. Uh, thanks, Akshay. Yes. Uh, so Neo4j is a graph database an analytics company and uh, graph theory has been uh, around for a very long time. I think in 1960s and 70s, uh, the concept originated from early AI and semantic networks uh, at that time. And there have been databases even prior to Neo4j around the similar theory. Uh, there was a hierarchical database from IBM and there was like a network databases. There was an IDS, I think was the company. They had it and all that. And this is in 60s and 70s. So around 2000s, when ML and his team was working on different kind of domain applications, they were like, hey, most of the domain data is kind of a graph. And, and it's, it's weird that we don't have a database that was in market that allowed you to build uh, graph data structures efficiently. And so that's when in 2007, actually, ML and his co-founders started the company. Uh, we open source our first database, made it available to the community, and it became immediately popular with developers because developers had these complex data structures they wanted to store, and relational model was limiting at times for uh, for them in some of these complex uh, use cases. Um, so the whole concept is uh, it's basically knowledge graphs or graphs like you know they represent your information in form of nodes and relationships. Our nodes are entities like people, objects, locations, events, those kind of entities. And relationships are how are these entities related to each other. For example, if you have a customer and a product, a customer purchases a product, they review a product. So purchasing, reviewing can be kinds of relationships. And the property graph model, which is what Neo4j made popular, allows you to also store properties for these nodes and relationships, so or edges, many people call them edges too. So nodes and edges, which makes it much easier and simpler for developers to use uh, that kind of a model and build applications. So we have always been focused on developers who want to build applications and providing a database for them. Uh, around 2011, around four or five years in the business, it was the first time we uh, provided a query language so that you could interact with the data because you know having just a database and apis to use them is complex 
And like SQL made relational databases more popular. So we came out with Cypher that was 2011, allowed people to like, you know, communicate with the database with a language that was much easier to use, according to us, from for graph data. Uh, 2017, uh, we launched uh, graph analytics capability. Uh, and then 2024, actually this year, uh, finally, we were able to work with various other organizations across the globe. And uh, ISO has finally ratified a graph query language. Majority of it is based on Cypher as only other language other than SQL as a standardized query language for uh, for the whole industry. So, uh, so that's a brief history about like Neo4j graphs in general. And we can talk more about knowledge graphs and how their popularity started and stuff like that. But just briefly, that's that's actually a background on the company. Yeah, and I and I think what's so interesting about graph databases is to your point, Sudhir, th- that that is a brief history, but it, it spans over fifty years. Exactly. Right. So this this idea that the the natural it, it's so natural to store knowledge as a graph, right? Objects have properties. Properties have relationships between each other. So why don't we do it this all the time? And, and that kind of leads me to one of my my first. Honestly, one of the biggest questions that I have is, it's just for my own self personal, and I hope other people want to know this as well, which is because graph databases have been around for so long, Google started introducing knowledge graphs over 10 years ago, I think in 2011 and 2012 or something like that. This this technology, even the idea of using a knowledge graph is not new. What is it about 2024? Like, you know, wh- why 2024? Why is this the year that knowledge graphs are, are finally going to kind of make it, so to speak, that people are finally gravitating towards that solution for their RAG applications or even beyond their RAG applications? You know, what, what, is it, what is it in your mind? Like, what is it about now that makes it a really, you know, a popular technology? That's a great question, Sinan. But first, let me give you a brief background and then we'll get to the exact question. Perfect. You're absolutely right. In 2012, Google publishes this blog on knowledge graphs and how you went from blue links, pure blue links, to actual rich responses to questions. And what that meant was a knowledge graph of places and people and having more information that's structured like that. And when you ask a question about, tell me more about Seattle, I'm based in Seattle. So Seattle, you get a right-hand card which says Seattle, this is the population, this is additional information, or you ask about people. So basically, the realization was purely text-based discovery versus like structured discovery through knowledge graphs. Structured discovery through knowledge graph is much richer. So that was basically the first time somebody showing the difference and actually there's a great video about this and all that stuff. And being a Zoogler, I really love, I've seen that blog multiple times myself, right? So that's then. Since then, in last 10 to 15 years, since Neo4j has been in market, we have seen graph adoption of graph technology in various industries for various use cases, right? For example, in financial services, almost every major bank uses graph technology for fraud detection and anti-money laundering. Uh, like manufacturing, most of the supply chain representation is on Neo4j, like, you know, as a as a graph representation. Or uh, you will see all of the parts graphs, like whether it's Airbus, whether it's like similar companies, all of their bill of material for an aircraft is actually in, in a graph format, and that's how it is stored. Uh, six out of seven intelligence agencies use uh, graph technology for, like, you know, intelligence analytics. You have a bad actor. Who's the other bad actors that link to what is happening? So all of that kind of stuff. So we like almost every healthcare company uses it. But you're right. Like mostly all of these different companies have been using graph technology for use cases where you had to represent this complex business data in form of a graph and use it for specific use cases. In retail, it's like customer 360, and you're bringing customer and product and behavioral data and all. So that's where it was. I think there has been a major shift in last three to four years, which has like created this, like, you know, trifecta of effects, I say, to generate even more interest for next generation applications. Because you see these graph applications for different use cases, they're there. But I think the three big trends or waves that have come together 
One is like just generally big data and data centralization. Like with the advent of cloud data warehouses and in like, you know, with Snowflake and Databricks and BigQuery and, and Fabric and all of these, like in S3 being the primary one on, on having this centralized data lake where you can bring data. I think when you're in a domain, in a use case, do you need a graph representation is one thing. But once now you've got all your data and broken the silos and you're centralized, you need a representation to like, you know, view all of that data in a, in a fashion that makes sense. So I think that was one wave, I think. Now you have all your business data in one place and businesses are more complex or like, you know, environments. They have like a lot of different entities. They're all interrelated and it's a complex environment. And so, so as your data gets represents your business, you need a better representation. The second thing is just cloud computing and database as a service, right? If you want to introduce a new database in a company, it's complex. A developer wanting to build their applications wants a new database. They have to go through a lot of hoops. And with cloud, what happened was, hey, it's just an spin it up and then start writing code. It's super easy and easy to get started. And the finally, I would say with advent of, large language models and gen AI capabilities, it solved the other side of the thing, which is like, hey, now I want to build a gen AI application. I want to represent all this data and knowledge I have into some structure that makes most sense. And this brings me back to the 2012 paper and the blog. It's like, what's the best representation of your knowledge that LLMs and generative AI technologies can benefit from? It it seems like knowledge graphs. And so that was the Third wave that brought it together and said, now you have all your data. With cloud, it's easy to get started. And with large language models, you want it structured in a way that it's super easy to make sense of and answer complex questions and stuff like that. So I think those are the three things coming together. You see this massive interest in, people call it graph rag, but just generally in knowledge graphs and stuff. Yeah, and I think that that speaks to a... I mean, we, we've said this before on the show, so I, I think people will will not be surprised, but a, a lot of my philosophy on large language models is that they are by far some of the best reasoning engines that we've ever built, period. They're, they're not always the best, let's say, you know, retrieval or thinking engines, right? I think when LLMs first came out, when ChatGPT, let's say, first came out, which is not the underlying LLM, but, you know, the, the product on top of it, people decided, oh, like I... This I'm going to ask this thing questions. It's going to give me answers. It's going to be amazing. And, and it worked for a lot of cases, but it was really quick to figure out that knowledge cuts, knowledge cutoffs were a big problem. Hallucinations were a big problem. So immediately people decided, oh no, how do we augment this thing? You know, you know, foreshadowing. How do we augment this thing with some long-term memory? The graph uh, or rather vector databases came on the scene. Our first episode, actually, we were talking about vector databases. And then all of a sudden, people are like, hold on, don't we have some technology specifically designed for, for not specifically, but really well designed for organizing knowledge? Oh, right, graphs. And I, and I feel like there was this kind of aha moment in, in, in the market or among developers where we said, oh my God, is it finally time to really adopt the gra- the knowledge graph and i think sudhir i think those three waves to me are are perfect right we had this kind of information age where we figured out how to amass this information as quickly as possible and and make huge data tables and and warehouses or lakes or whatever you want to call them lake houses lake houses perfect everyone wants a lake house full of data that's everyone's it's on everyone's uh, first million dream uh and then we decided oh no this thing is so gigantic how are we supposed to reason through all of this data? How do we actually make it actionable? And I think the LLMs can finally make this data really actionable, especially with the advent of cloud and, and, and that ability to run things and spin things up quickly. So to, to me, that, that story is, is pretty much perfect. So that actually kind of brings us perfectly into the modern, quote unquote, the modern application of, of graphs right now, which is graph rag, the idea that you can augment an LLM yeah. with you know, call it longer term memory stored in a knowledge graph. Can can you walk us through kind of just, just the basics of graph rag or or what what is it that people definitely know about graph rag and, and what do people maybe not understand so much about graph rag as it exists today? Perfect. I think let me start by the basic concept of 
I, I call it separation of concerns, or or you can name it in different ways, but it's the whole theory is large language models were built for language understanding, generating content and explaining things. And as you said, reasoning on top of given information. And then there's the most important thing that we all have to figure out is in an enterprise environment where you have information that is primarily owned by an organization, mostly we consider our information as our intellectual property. The only thing that differentiates multiple organizations in the same market is information they collect and how they actually make better decisions. So I think making sure that you have like, you know, tools that can provide better decision-making capability requires both sides of the equation, wherein you have some kind of a language understanding, but you need this knowledge to be represented. And so the whole idea, first wave, you're right, was like, hey, let's take all this unstructured data, convert it into vector, store the vector, vectorized data into a store, and we will just like do a similarity search on it. And great, we we have unlocked value from a lot of unstructured data, which is great. Like I think people say 80% of data in the world is unstructured in documents and all. And now you're unlocking that value as what everybody thought. But as organizations move forward in that journey, they realize, oh, first of all, one that is limiting because just doing similarity search is not enough. And we'll talk more about where the limitations are. The second is there's a lot of decisions are today made with the structured information in the organization. So, you know, you need something that can blend structured and unstructured together in the form of knowledge. And so first of all, what is graph rag, right? Graph rag is, first of all, representation of your both structured and unstructured data in form of graph. We basically can take your unstructured data, store it as vectors, as properties, as vectors, but we can link your document create chunks of those documents and link them in form of graph. So you know, this is the document, here's the first node, here's the second chunk, third chunk, and they're all linked to each other. That's one piece of it. Second thing in graph rag you do is you extract entities from these chunks. So you augment the information that you have from pure text-like thing, coming back to the same like knowledge graph thing from Google is like, now you can extract entities and create rich information set to go with these chunks and documents. So now every time you give an answer, now you can go to the vector search plus what the augmented information entities that you have. More importantly, in an enterprise environment, you can also now take the structured entities and relationships and everything that they have internally and augment that around those entities. So now it becomes a very rich information set. I will give you an example, right? We work with a lot of organizations, let's say in manufacturing space. Uh, you have your parts graph. I was giving you an example earlier where you have a aircraft and it has all these parts and it's millions of parts. But most of the parts manuals are documents. Historically, they have been sitting somewhere else in the organization super hard. Now you have a question, hey, there is this kind of an error happening. How do I debug it and what do I do? If you have one set of knowledge graph that has unstructured vectorized data plus this, you can literally do a search, vector search, go to the right document, go find the entities, filter down to the exact product and the aircraft and the part that you're is seeing issues, and then get a very rich information back. So that is graph rag. Graph rag is basically unstructured and structured data represented as vectors plus graph, and then ability to go ahead and search on top of it to find the right information and then augment it with all the entities we have. Now, I think this is this is great as theory, but actually we have seen like some of the independent organizations do various tests. Like I think data.world uh, end of 2023 did some analysis comparing and their thing was um, accuracy when you have like complex questions improved 3x across a bunch of, I think they had 43 business questions and they tried to compare it. So it was like 3x better accuracy in information just because you're not just doing similarity search, but now you have entities that you can augment with and answer. Now, similarly, Microsoft's research did some research in this area, and their thing was baseline rag, which is just pure vector similarity search. It struggles whenever you want to connect the dots between concepts across single document or multiple documents. Like, like now, because the knowledge, it doesn't have any kind of a way to figure that out. You're going to do similarity search, take a context and give it to you. 
So that becomes harder in those things. Now, so we have seen like really good research coming out, which shows one, you get much better accuracy, but also correctness and richness of answers. The second thing that we have seen with GraphRag that happens is as a developer, when you're building a Gen AI application, you have this question answer thing, you ask a question, you give an answer. The next thing is, how do you know, like how to debug it? Like what the data looks like? When you create vectors, they're good for machines, not for developers and users. In graph world, you can literally see what entities you have along with those chunks. So it's not just text converted into vectors. You also have these entities, so it's easy to debug, easy to understand. And the third one is explainability. So -hmm. whenever you give an answer, you got the answer back, you want to now say, hey, why did I get that answer? Like, why do you think we should use this particular answer? Like, you know, for example, uh, tell me something about a particular company and you give them some information. But if you want to know, okay, give me all the entities and the reasons why you actually gave that answer, you can provide that along with it through the graph side of the house, not just vector. So I think that's the benefits of it. But the whole idea is, How can you be a super set of vectors plus graph technology, build a single knowledge graph and answer rich questions? Yeah. And and, and I think the, you're saying it so well, the, the, the idea that it's not graphs are replacing vectors. And I think that's a question that I get a lot as an educator, as a consultant is, oh, well, we don't need the vector database anymore, right? Like you're going to build a graph for us. And I'm like, well, first of all, building a graph, we'll talk about that later. Second of all, we're not getting rid of the vector database. The idea is that this is an ecosystem. We, we, are, we are trying to um, integrate as many tools as we possibly can to make the system consistent, reliable, transparent, performant, scalable, all of the above and, yeah. and, and more. So let's actually, I want to I wanna go back to one of the first things you said, which is when we think about GraphRag and the idea of an addition of a graph to the system, most people, at least today, who are, who are building modern AI applications, they're, they're, they're probably starting with a very simple concept of vector rag. And, and one of the funny things I like to tell people, or you know, funny, quote unquote, is, is, is that a lot of the research, the technology around what makes pure vector search uh, possible is also roughly 10, 12 years old, right? We're talking about word to vec, doc to vec, yeah. the efficient ability to encode semantic information from raw text into machine readable vectors is, is, is newer technology actually than the graph itself. Um, and it's only in the last four years, to your point, it, it, that that technology, the embedding technology has you know, skyrocketed due to LLMs. So it makes sense that it's, it's kind of like the first step, first foray into augmented generation, some kind of, some kind of RAG application. Can you, and it's my understanding, and I'm, I'm hoping, Sudhir, you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong here. It's my understanding is that the, the, the big limitation to just a pure vector search still lives in that semantic compression, so to speak. That semantic translation from raw text to vectors is still limited, both in the idea that the domain knowledge is, is is not getting captured in that, but also that the nuances of, of text are still not getting efficiently captured by that translation to vectors. Is that is that true? Is that still the limitation? I think it is in a way, right? Because yes, what you said is true, but also when you basically take large documents and chunk them, the context window of your knowledge is limited to mm. what you are sending in the chunks. How do you extract these concepts and semantics and then link them across not just different chunks in a document, but across documents? How are you going to represent that? That actually is the bigger bigger thing to think about. And that's where I think I think the concepts, and this is what Microsoft RAG like paper was talking about, is like, hey, how do you connect the dots between different things is going to be interesting problem to solve. And I think graphs are better at that than just purely vector databases. One of the things that we have done, and this will also tell you, is like we recently released a graph rack tool. And one of the first things it does is it takes any unstructured document and can, or like a video from YouTube or something like that, and or first creates a knowledge graph out of it. 
And it, as I was saying, it first thing it does is it takes the document, chunks it, like any vector database would do. It keeps the graph representation of it, but also vectorized representation in an index with it. This is exactly what vectors would do. So we get the information. But the second thing we do is we extract all the core entities from it. And LLMs are really good at identifying these entities, but in the context window of what you, information you're giving them. So within the chunks, we basically ask it, hey, give me all the core entities that you have found. And for enterprise customers, we also ask them, like, hey, do you want to predefine kinds of entities you care about from this document? Because the LLM will generate like, like hundreds of entities that may not be relevant to you. So you can say, I'm only interested in people, places, uh, concepts like parts and something like that. So if you say that, then you only extract those entities and attach it to the chunks that we have and the document you have. The advantage of building that kind of a knowledge graph now, and one document is fine. Now imagine if you have thousands of documents and you got the right set of entities around it. So all these concepts that have been collected across multiple documents now get connected. And this is the connecting the dots across all of these, that becomes much and more richer. So the knowledge graph becomes much richer as you add more and more information to the uh, to the platform. So that I think is the bigger concept to think about. Uh, I think the limitations of vector stores will be one, how, how you're generating the embeddings and then what kind of embeddings like extraction you can do on searches, similarity searches you can do, that will be still there. But that knowledge is the thing. The other thing I will talk about is you're right. Creating embeddings, the concept has been there. I think the LLMs enrich the ability to create embeddings from, like, you know, based on the knowledge from the web that, that it got, right? So massive amounts of data. Actually, internally at Neo4j, we also had created this ability with our graph analytics tool, GDS, where you can take structured data. So you can take, we have something called node to vec which is basically you can take an entity and all its relationships and convert that into vectors now. So you can do vectorized searches, not just on the text that you got from unstructured data, but your structured data now can also be converted into embeddings and then do vectorized searches on them. So you want to find who are people that are similar to this kind of a person who has all these kind of relationships, we can do that, or customers or products and all. So I think this combination of embeddings coming from unstructured information plus structured representation doing similarity searches and then using the entities for like you know additional context i think is it makes it much much more richer one thing sudhir uh you're right we're seeing and we'll link to this you you all have written a graph rag manifesto there's yes. you know the microsoft paper that reignited interest there's now you know new research that's been published at academic conferences on hybrid rag so some of the stuff that Sanan and you are talking about a combination of search methods uh, to augment RAG. One thing I'm curious about is there's this, uh, you know, Sanan and I have talked about it offline, this, this demo disillusionment, right? Where people try a new method, they quickly get started and there is performance gains, right? So some people are being introduced to graph RAG from the, you know, anthropic, it could be an academic paper, it could be you know, an agent vendor, they have no clue. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, since you know, Neo4j has been sort of the stalwart in this space, et cetera, it, it seems like to me when I look at that information retrieval and entity extraction, that conceptual mapping that is the core of what powers, if we just think about even how LLMs reason over data, uh, that seems to be the key. What obstacles, once people get, they implement this, they might get started, they might even, and we'll link to your post of connecting their data sources, converse, con converting their existing data into uh, into nodes and edges. What then are you seeing in an enterprise context of how do people get this even more accurate? What are the obstacles they're, they're running into? Because GraphRed, I think, gets you from that demo use case of 60% to maybe 80 to 90, but they're still eking that out. Yes. And I'm, I think we're at that point, maybe we're in a month or two where people are going to run into what maybe any tips you can provide for folks of maybe what are some expected challenges they might run into and uh, you know how maybe some some advice for them? on that journey i think first of all i think graphs are really good at like expressing your domain knowledge in form of a graph graph pattern like right? nodes and relationships are nothing but if you can literally go on a whiteboard and draw your business and you can literally take those entities and relationships and that becomes your data model which is really good one of the things i have seen which is a big challenge in general is to go ahead and convert your data that you have whether it's in data lakes or lake houses 
or different representation that may be in different data stores into graphs actually requires the first step work like that needs to be uh, figured out and and there are tools that we have built and tools in the industry uh, we work with different partners i think we're working with intuit and intuit had built this node stream which is a whole project that allows you to go ingestion ingest into graphs and create them i think there are a lot of tooling happening there but that is the first thing and then what is the right structure i think the more interesting challenge that i've seen recently with building knowledge graphs using llms as a way to extracting entities has been more around deduping entities right so i think what is happening is i have unstructured information i'm creating entities we're working with one of the largest oil and gas companies uh petronas actually in in apac and we've been working with them so the first challenge is you take all this unstructured data convert it into knowledge graph and you start getting duplicate nodes and all that and and the first question is like how do you dedupe these things entity resolution has been one of the use cases that we have been working on for a while but from an unstructured data massive scale doing deduping is going to be the one step and you can't do it human intervention for this so i think we are working on different algorithms to go ahead and automatically cluster these kind of entities that are together and then provide some tooling for users but i think one akshay area that i see interesting challenges that will come is how do you go ahead and do this deduping of entities and how does that happen across different domains i was actually talking to one of the healthcare providers uh, and we were brainstorming on ideas of how we can leverage the technology uh, it's astrazeneca and their thing was hey but the uh, the codes that are used in different countries for different kind the medical codes they are different and so how do you dedupe them across different countries and now the knowledge graph is same but now you have to go ahead and bridge i never them. even thought of that that sounds like a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> yeah but those are the those are the real enterprise challenges when they come and so i think helping organizations solve that is the next level of thing as people build these graphs and extract value and knowledge from from these things and so that i feel is one of the major areas uh, of innovation that i think we can go do and i think llms are good at this thing if they had all the context enterprise area they may not have all the context so that becomes an interesting I was I was literally just about to interject and say, is it a context issue? Like, is it the fact that it's obvious to a human, of course, it almost always is, that these codes are going to be different in different countries. It, therefore, it, does the limitation come back to how do we tell the LLM the context? It, how, do we do we fine tune that knowledge into it? Is yeah. that its own separate knowledge base to? You know, is that a pre-training graph and then a fine-tuning graph? Like, what? what I, I don't know. That maybe this is still very really nascent, you know, ideas. But like, what are the steps into kind of injecting that context into the system? You, you nailed it. I think this is exact kind of discussions and like you know areas that that we are looking into is exactly that. Which like, hey, can I pre-train a smaller model? I don't need like a mm -hmm. large model, but there's this maybe an opportunity to create a small language model. that's optimized for these different kind of codes across countries and it knows the context and then can you have a agent that actually just does that and then provides the context to the the next step in the process uh to to the large language model to answer or reason on it so i think there are different techniques you can use uh, i don't think you can just purely make it like in the context window try to provide that information in the in the prompt or something like that that won't work because the information is too much but i think there are different opportunities to innovate uh, with different partners there and see what we do but yeah there is an opportunity to maybe create small language models that are optimized for those kind of translation kind of activities and then use like agents to go figure that out but it um, always comes back to this idea of an ecosystem to me right yeah. like the the, yeah. the 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 proposed solutions for these always tend to be i mean obviously of course if it just deduped it in the first place we'd all be happy and no one would have this issue yeah. but it's just there's some limiting factors that just that's just not possible right now so i mean it seems obvious um that the the next step is okay well let's make the graph knowing that there's probably going to be some resolution issues duplication issues and but luckily we knew that ahead of time and while we were building the graph we also trained this slm small language model to say while it's building it's going to you know iteratively dedupe and before it builds the next edge or whatever that is and and uh, again it always just comes back to it, the uh, the premise should be 
how do we make these machine learning AI models, algorithms, how are they going to work together to build this cohesive system rather than, oh, well, luckily the LLM is so smart. It never made a mistake in the first place. I feel like that, that kind of, that kind of balance is, is, is hard to both talk about and also definitely harder to achieve. (laughs) Exactly. And also I think it all depends on the kinds of use cases you're trying to implement and make happen, right? I, I look at it and I'm like, broadly speaking, there are three categories of Uh, use cases I'm seeing customers implement, right? One is going from this, I call it like personalized customer experiences, but it's going from templatized to personalized experiences. And this is basically customer service kind of applications or ads that are now way more personalized to an individual. And the, the way it comes out is like, you basically know there is a customer that bought something and let's say you have some issue with that product and you want to go ahead and send them an email apologize and all that and so so you basically can get the product they bought when they bought it what was the issue you pass it to a large language model and say hey can you create a personalized email for them and it will generate like a really good email that they're they're good at that and then so you can do that in past what would you do you create a template and fill the name here i just did a mail merge to send to my all 52 customer advisory board customers and it was literally i was like laughing at myself why am i doing this this way mail merge is a good example of templatization but in the new world you don't need to do that you basically do personalized email so that's one category we see this a lot in retail customer like you know facing stuff and all that the second is this whole thing about democratizing knowledge in organizations i was talking about astrazeneca they have this knowledge graph of like all of their r and d research Historically, to extract real value from it, you needed to be a data scientist. Now they've basically put like a question answer capability on top of these things. And and now anybody can just ask a question, get the right answer. It does vector search, it provides entities, like it's all the same thing that we talked about. So it's it's a really great starting point and it will get better and better. But I've talked to like various companies, Ford has something similar that they have done and Petronas is trying to do that. And so like some of them with Neo4j, some of them may not be, but they're all experimenting with that. But there is this democratization of access to knowledge and how you get that, I think is is second class. And the third class that I've seen is the next generation Gen AI based applications that are more complex questions. And this is where I think what we were talking about is so relevant. And, and for example, uh, I was talking to, one of the leaders at, let's say, Siemens, and they are looking at, they have so many applications. They want to build a single question answer framework around it. What is the right technology for it? Like you will have to take knowledge out of all these different apps they provide, whether it is like, you know, MRP, MES, uh, ERP systems and all that, and then represent that into a knowledge. But then they need vector and knowledge and then some kind of complex agentic framework that will do multi-agent kind of uh, responses. And and these are super complex kind of a thing. And that is where I think we still have a lot of steps to go. Like when I see the first one is very easy to go to production. I think it's simple, like, but there's not complexity there. Second one, you can go to production really fast. The reason is it's internal and there is always a human involved. The third is where you have more complex questions. You need more reasoning. You need to be more clear. And that is the one where I think there is a lot more experimentation, innovation that needs to happen. And, and so that, that's how I see like, you know, categories. I completely agree. I think there's two points. I think if you are a developer who is just hearing this, this is another hype trend. There's two reasons I think that we're going to be hearing a lot more about GraphRag in the next six to 12 months. First is if you look at these agentic use cases, and I use that word agentic, you know, it's just tool function calls. We're not yes. trying to, regardless of what you think about the, the future of AI, if you look at the papers that are winning the best paper award that ICML, NeurIPS, they're about multi-step reasoning. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about, if you look at current RLHF, it's thumbs up, thumbs down, or some form of preference optimization. Yeah. Ideally, in three to four years when we're using complicated systems, it's actually akin to traversing a graph. Yes. And I think if you look at those papers, there is they're much less open on methodology than they were in 2019 or 2020, but there's an allusion to the importance of graphs in a very, very 
a strong nod from the major foundation model players that graphs are a big player. The second thing is a topic that we've addressed. You know, we've had a, you know, a former unicorn founder on the podcast recently who was talking about the main obstacle to deploying generative AI in an enterprise environment is access controls. It's data loss. Yes. And if you you can't enforce row-based security and you can't enforce, you know, our back easily on an ex- on structured on these sort of LMs that you're stuffing into a vector store, what makes a lot more sense is what just Sanan was talking about. You have these different sections of the graph that are accessed and you, you know, give certain models different access to different sections of the graph or different versions of the graph. And so those are two reasons that I'm curious to get your thoughts here. But I actually think just those trends of, you know, there tends to be contours of, you know, what happened in early cloud days was a lot of it was there was maybe some security pushback, but the speed of velocity, there's certain kind of fundamental uh, commercial factors in the enterprise that tend to shape technological development and kind of be symbiotic. And I'm seeing both security requirements and that's generally where we're seeing uh, these reasoning agents start to go as intersecting with with graphs. And so I, I completely agree. Yeah, I think this is absolutely right. And I, I think, you know, even in search world, right, like what you can search, what authentication, how do you go ahead and make sure you have access to the information that you should be able to use? That is the fundamental thing. And with large language models, like technologies that are coming in, the question would be, how would that come together? And this is why I fundamentally believe there's a separation of concern at some level of the thing, right? Like you have this model that understand language, but then you have this knowledge that you have with restrictions that an enterprise puts on it. And you, like, I have access to few things. I shouldn't have access to everything. And how that gets traversed is one thing. And and the the patterns and the research that, you know, I've seen interesting stuff happening. One of the largest airline uh, like you know technology divisions at an airline out of germany i won't name the names we were talking about and this is the exact thing we were talking about is like hey if you had this graph i don't want to do vector search i don't want to do text to cipher which is like text to sql kind i want to do graph traversals to answer questions based on questions that are coming for the agents and they should be able to traverse through it and then answer them rather than trying to have a predefined notion of what the answer looks like and all that. So I think we will see a lot more research coming on that side and that could be the next wave of like answering complex questions. I think we haven't gone to that part of the enterprise yet and that will take some time. I'm I'm assuming the first two use cases I talked about are easier to go make happen. I think this is where I actually think there are some best practices we should also discuss for companies uh, there are complex things and there are simple things and you need to figure out how you want to get started. And all. Well, I think that's actually a really good place to go next because the, the idea of multi-hop you know, reasoning, multi-hop meaning reasoning through multiple sources of information. There are benchmarks for this, like hot pot QA, I believe is one of them. That that you're right. I think that's kind of entering the the, the 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 more complex domain of where graphs really are going to start showing deltas in performance. But let's actually, I, I would I would love to hear some of those. Like, what are the you know top three or top you know n pieces of advice that you would give to people, developers, you know, enterprise companies who are just hearing this term graph rag and just kind of now coming to terms with this kind of symbiosis of technologies, what are the top end, let's say, pieces of advice that you would give uh, people who are just trying to figure out what are the first steps into the space? What do they need? What should they be aware of? And, and then what are the gotchas that they really should be aware of as early as possible? Yeah, I think, let me start with broadly, like, you know, in general, building a Gen AI based solution in an organization what do you what what are the things i've seen uh, that are gotchas or what you should be doing that makes more sense like just looking at like lots of customers what they're doing right i think first is starting small with clear business goals is super valuable i know it is like cliche statement but i've seen lot of organizations starting from top down approach to this one which is like hey this is a cool technology let's figure it out let's experiment everywhere but not having a clear understanding of where you want to see the results and i don't think i said this in one of the other forums you don't have to lead every time i think you can follow in few cases and 
there are organizations that have seen benefits in some set of use cases, whether it's customer experience stuff or internal knowledge stuff or whatever. I think just following those paths to define the value and actually implementing is a much better strategy because like you don't have to solve the most complex problem first. You can solve the simpler ones early and then get some benefits and then go implement it. So that's one. The second thing uh, I, I want to say is like use LLM and the technologies on generative side for what they were built for, right? Like Gen AI technology and large language models were primarily built for generation of information, not for being a definitive answer to questions. And I've seen this, I was talking to one of the customers and they were like, we have built a decision engine using LLM. So it's in production. I'm like, can you please explain how that works? Because my understanding of the technology, it doesn't allow you to do that. They're like, oh, no, no, no. We don't make decisions in it. We make decisions in our graph and then we just use it for explaining to the user what it is. I'm like, okay, that I understand. I don't understand the other part. But just like separation of what it's good for and what it's not. Understand the basics and just like have that. And I think one of the third things I would say is not related to being successful. It's more of my experience is define clear guidelines for teams on what data you can share with large language models versus you cannot because there is a lot of confusion within organizations and individuals of what you can and cannot do. And so I think I have seen companies literally block like, you know, access to large language, like open AI APIs in some cases and others, because suddenly they realize people have started sharing customer information from their databases, which they should never have done Oops. in first case. Like, yeah. So I think the main thing is like just having clear guidelines for people of what you should be able to use with the technology versus not and what is enterprise and what is not versus also looking at some of the small language models. One of the things that people should look at is how does the security work in where the model is running and how your data is stored and all of that stuff. And, and working with a bunch of cloud providers, I think there are different techniques of like how you deploy these models and all. So I think all of that becomes super critical to look at. And I think once you have that, once you have them standardized like guidelines and practices, much easier to go take those simple use cases, make them successful, add more and more knowledge to it, then continue uh, like you know with that. Uh, the other thing, finally, I will say is like we did build bunch of tooling and bunch of like integrations to show people how to get started with GraphRag, what it is. In literally, like, like you can use our free database online. You can take any unstructured data, convert it into a, a graph, start asking questions, see, and all of that is open source code base. So you can actually build on top of it. So before writing a single line of code, you can actually experiment with things and, and figure out how things are going to turn out for you. So I think that's another thing for me is like just test before you start building and that way then you fail fast you know what you can do with it and then go from there. So those will be a few things I would say. That's uh, super helpful. One thing I will uh, maybe emphasize uh, on your kind of second or third point, the lineage is super important. The single biggest design pattern I'm seeing requested, top three things in every chat or co-pilot use case I'm seeing across our portfolio companies, et cetera, people want to interrogate <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the data. They want to actually see how it arrived. Why making an Why did you say this? 100%. Oh, here's your three thousand dimension vector. Oh, thanks. That's really helpful. <laughs> actually, I'm telling you, if you like all the users, all the viewers of this, if you use our graph rack tool, just go take a look at it, search, you will get it. I will, if it's possible, Akshay, we can put a link to it. We'll uh, put a link. Yes, definitely. Yeah. We'll, put, we'll put links. If you yeah. use it, and if you ask a question, and if you say, provide details, it will exactly show you why that answer came. Perfect. What was the vector, but what were the entities and how the date, the answer came. And that is exactly what matters. Like in enterprises, you're right. The next question after getting the answer is like, why? Why is this right? Like what 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 happens when the answer is wrong? Can you audit it and can you explain what happened is the most important thing. And that is, is the graph we, wrong. Is the LLM wrong? What happened in this ecosystem? Exactly. Yes. I think that every leader, data leader that I've talked to, that's their top of mind is all of these are fine. How will I know that it's right or wrong? And, and even if 2% answers are wrong, I need to be able to go back and figure out why. 
yeah. and then fix it for the next cycle. Hundred percent. And I think the thing that graphs do that maybe traditional there's you know you can prompt the LLM to basically explain its reasoning, but it lets you separate concerns over data model. I am seeing, I have multiple companies who are winning six figure contracts. And I say the wow moment of the demo, the difference is that they are able to show that and it provides some set of element. It also provides an opportunity for, you know, the sort of stuff Sinan talked about on kind of fine tuning, eventually developing workflows around that. But I think we'll definitely link to um, the graph frag manifesto yeah. that you and your team were so kind to publish uh, some of the research mentioned as well as that getting started. Um, but Sudhir, thank you so much for coming on. This was uh, super, super fun. Yes. Uh, I had a blast. Uh, and so uh, this is, this is delightful. No, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was great talking to you guys. Awesome. Thank you.